right. It is, we are on the hour here. Thank you to everyone who's been joining. I think we should begin. So hello to everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from the world today. We are about to start the presentation about the size and state of the uh, language industry today. My name is Nika Olaverdi. I'm the VP of Marketing at NIMSI Insights, and I'm very, very happy to introduce our event today and our panelists. Today's webinar will last about 45 minutes, and at the end, we will have about 15 minutes for your questions. So go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A or into the chat window, and we will try to get to them. If you haven't done so already, check out the NIMSI 100 report. The analysis is live on the site now. And let me introduce our present presenters today. We have Sarah Hickey, v VP of Research and Lead Analyst of the NIMSI 100 Report, who is based in Germany near, near Dusseldorf. We will also hear from Balen uh, Arguello Garcia, our Lead Media Researcher and Director of Learning, who is uh, who has been helping Sarah and who has co-researched and wrote the report with Sarah. Belen is based in Spain near Valencia. And of course, you probably know Renato Beninato, who's looking very tall from this angle. And he is the co-founder and chairman of NIMSI Insights. And he is joining us from Seattle. I'm joining you from Los Angeles. Uh, Sarah, let's take it away and start with you. Thank you, Nika. Yeah, let's start by jumping right into the ranking. This slide right here introduces you to the 15 largest companies in the language services industry based on their 2020 revenues. For the third year in a row, TransPerfect takes the lead, followed by LineBridge and Language Line Solutions. These are the only three companies in the world that exceed half a billion dollars in revenue. Last year, the top 10 companies in the industry were all headquartered in English-speaking countries. But this year, thanks mostly to a lot of M&A activity, France-based Accolade Group has made it onto the eighth place in our ranking. However, if you look at the top 15 LSPs, um, they are still predominantly headquartered in English-speaking countries. Um, aside from Accolade, there are only two other companies, and those are Switzerland-based Star Group and Pactera Technology based in China that are located in non-English speaking countries. Looking at the size of the companies in terms of revenue, it jumps, right, um, jumps out at you right away that uh, the top three on our list um, are a lot bigger than the rest. Uh, in fact, if we look at the top 15, then the top three companies make up close to 40% of their combined revenue. And looking at the top 100, they actually make up 25% of the combined revenues of all top 100 companies. So um, this is quite a lot. And we can expect that this gap is going to widen even further between like the top three or five or 10 and the rest of the companies in our ranking. Um, because we've seen so much consolidation uh, over the last year and we can expect more of it to come in the next years as well. Right, uh, since we already mentioned M&A, let's stay on this topic for a little bit and address the elephant in the room. Um, because right now in March, 2021, our ranking that we just published is already obsolete. Uh, this is because of major acquisitions that happened in 2020 and in early 2021 um, that all changed the LSP landscape again. Our ranking, like I said, is based on 2020 revenues. So if we consider the M&A activity that went into effect after December 31st, 2020, then the list of the top 10 LSPs in March 21 actually looks like this, what you can see on the screen. Um, let me briefly talk you through this adjusted ranking. Um, RWS is the new de facto leader in the industry after buying long-term rival SDL for more than 800 million British pounds or roughly 1 billion US dollars. After the acquisition by RWS, the SDL brand will now disappear and all units will be rebranded to RWS. The deal closed on November 3rd, 2020, um, which is after the end of the financial year for RWS, which is at the end of September. 
So that's why we still considered both companies separately in this year's ranking based on 2020 revenues. But as it stands right now in March 21, RWS is in fact the new number one in the market. Um, if we continue looking at the adjusted ranking, you may also notice that SDI Media has disappeared um, because at the end of January, Ayuno Media Group announced its intention to acquire the former rival. And by now the deal has actually gone through. It only closed last week. And the company is going to actually rebrand to Ayuno SDI Group. Um, but here now adjusted ranking we still list them as Ayuno Media Group with a combined revenue of $376 million, um, which makes them the number one in the area of media localization. Um, aside from mergers and acquisitions, uh, we actually also had a notable spin-off in the industry this year. Lionbridge sold its AI division, Lionbridge AI, to Telus, um, a digital customer experience company from Canada. The deal went through for approximately 1.2 billion Canadian dollars or more than 900 million US dollars. Um, the sale was effective on December 31st. So again, in our 2020 ranking, uh, we still considered the Lionbridge AI revenue in the overall figure for Lionbridge, but in 21, this revenue figure will now need to be deducted. So that then places Lionbridge in fourth position in our adjusted ranking with um, 546 million US dollars. So in order to get some perspective on growth and consolidation in the LSP space, we decided to take a look back um, at the numbers for the top companies in the industry in the year 2000 and then to 2020 up until this point. So in the year 2000, um, Berlitz Global Net, uh, which is now part of Lionbridge, was the number one in the market with a revenue of $103.9 million. And now if we look at the pro forma consolidated revenues of RWS and SDL, the largest LSP in 2020 reached $936.7 million. So this is equivalent to either a compound annual growth rate of 11.6% or a nominal growth of more than 900% in 20 years, which is quite significant. So as it stands, RWS, RWS now also outperforms uh, former leader TransPerfect by more than $85 million in the adjusted ranking. And we can expect that RWS is going to break the billion dollar barrier in 21. This shift in leadership in the market is also coming with a geographic shift because it's the first time that a company based in the United Kingdom will be leading the industry. Okay, um, now let's take a look at growth. Um, um, Renato will tell you more about that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let's talk about growth now. Last year, our projection for 2020 was that the industry would reach $57 billion and that it would continue to grow at a compound growth rate or CAGR of 6.2%. This was already a reduction from the 7% that we had estimated in 2018. Once the pandemic hit, we adjusted our project projections about this time last year, but still believed that growth was going to happen, just at a lower rate. Back then, we projected 2.5% growth for 2020 and 5% growth from 2021 onwards. This is what we predicted last year. Now, let's take a brief look uh, at some of the data we collected that can tell us what actually happened in 2020. Our data showed that annual growth among the 100 largest LSPs has slowed significantly, increasing 6.8% between 2019 and 2020, compared to an increase of 11.5% in the previous period. However, the combined revenue of the companies comprising the top 10 positions in 2020 rose 9% compared to the combined revenues of the same cohort in 2019. Nika, I think, yes, stay, let's stay on this one a little bit. Um, the top 50 positions grew by 6.4%, as you can see here in the graph, and the remaining positions from 51 to 100 grew by 10% compared to last year's ranking. 
What the data in the previous slides show is that the industry did in fact grow again. So I think we can move to the next one. Just at the, so uh, the, 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 pre, uh, the industry grew and it grew just slower than we had predicted. So uh, now we can confidently estimate that the industry did in fact reach $55 billion in 2020. Our projection before was that we were going to be at around 57 and we ended the year at about 55 billion. We're also putting our growth estimates back on track and predict that the industry should grow to something like $58.3 billion in 2021 and would reach the incredible number of $73.6 billion by 2025. And we're uh, taking into consideration a growth rate of about 6% a year. It, this is a cumulative uh, aggregate growth rate of uh, 6%. So uh, although uh, the consolidation continues, the language industry continues to be very fragmented. Um, Nika, can we move to the next? Oh, there you go. So the top 100 companies in our ranking accounted for just 15% of the overall uh, language industry in 2020, a rise of only half of 1% from last year. This is the tip of the iceberg, right? The biggest companies in the industry uh, only represent less than 8% of the industry as a whole. If we add to the watch list in our close but no cigar honorary ranking, uh, where we track the 153 companies by now that are listed in, in, in the ranking that you should have downloaded, uh, <laughs> All 153 large LSPs tracked by NIMSI, they represent about 21.4% of the language industry in 2020. It's a little bit like the 80-20 the rule, the, the Pareto principle. The biggest companies in the industry represent 20% uh, of the real industry. But uh, what you see is that the industry is still mostly made up of companies much smaller than $10 million in revenue. Let's talk about the 10 fastest growing LSPs on our ranking. All of them grew more than 27% in 2020, and four companies have even grown more than 50% year over year. This is quite impressive. Uh, the top prize goes to the Switzerland-based company Swiss TXT. Uh, they sell media localization and other media services, which is a space that is in constant growth, as we all know. It is worth noting that the biggest growth in the industry was due to mergers and acquisitions this year, rather than organic growth. The top three fastest growing LSPs listed in this chart all bought other companies in 2020. You can read uh, uh, more about this topic. We have a full section in the full report. Another metric that we collected was the productivity of LSPs. And I've been following this for over 20 years. If I'm not mistaken, in the beginning, in the first ranking that I produced, the average revenue per company was around $35,000. Looking at the top 100 companies, the average revenue per employee in 2020 was about $102,000. In 2019, the average was higher. It was $128,000. So there is a decrease of about 20%. However, in specific segments of the ranking, productivity was higher than in the top 100, that the average that we got to the top 100. For example, the average productivity for the top 20 was $142,000 last year. Considering company size, seven out of the top 10 most productive company in 2020 employ less than 100 professionals. So uh, um, naturally the, the smaller companies tend to be more nimble and they can be more productive. Only one company in this ranking of the, the most productive um, has more than 1000 people on staff. And now 
Belen is going to tell us more about some other interesting data from our research. Belen, take it away. Thank you, Renata, and thank you everybody for being here today. So yeah, some interesting findings that, that we found this year are, for example, related to the who is running the LSPs in our ranking, right? And we found out that 20% 20 20 of the largest LSP in our ranking have female CEOs. This is great because compared to other industries um, that, uh, and, and the Fortune 500 companies, where only 2.6% uh, of companies have female CEOs, we're doing pretty well, right? However, there's something else. Um, the, these 20 uh, women-run companies in our ranking only make up around 8% of the total revenue of the top 100. So not, so not that much. And there are no female CEOs among the top 10 largest companies in the industry. So there's still so much that we have to do to improve equality, but we're not doing so bad. In any case, the, these interesting data points that we found uh, are great, but we need to really um, dig deeper to understand what the, this data mean for our industry. And we would like to, to keep digging into that in the coming months. So stay tuned because we're going to, to be talking about that. Uh, something that is so also important uh, and what the ranking is not showing is that many of the top providers in our ranking, uh, they are not even competing with each other. We're probably TransPerfect and IUNO are not competing with, for the same clients because the market is so fragmented that uh, there are many clusters of top players for the various sectors within the language services industry. Uh, of course, uh, as we said, um, no one comes near uh, Ayuno when it comes to media localization or near keywords when it comes to game localization, right? Or near language line solutions in the area of interpreting. So in, in every segment of the market, there are a handful of LSPs that have reached the level of brand awareness that puts them in the top of mind position for the buyers. From a buyer's point of view, the top companies in each segment of the industry are more likely to be bundled and tend to be interrelated in the client's mind. And this is a slide that, do, that you can see here shows these clusters inside our ranking that could be rankings on their own, right? Some, some other data that, that we found in, in our survey is related to the top services. So, and we can go to the next slide. Um, the research show that the services most commonly provided by LSPs that responded to our survey are not surprisingly translation and localization, right? Because if they are not offering these services, why are they in our ranking? So almost 100% of respondents respondent said that they are offering this service, followed by machine translation and post editing with around 71%, subtitling. Uh, actually with 68%, uh, that's a high percentage. Uh, many companies are offering this service, I think, because the barrier to entry is quite low. And then despot publishing and graphic design with a 61 around 61% as well. Then other services such as copywriting, transcreation and content creation, as well as transcription are in fifth place. And on-site interpreting and dubbing voiceovers and audio services share the sixth place, as you can see here. Then when it comes to top verticals, um, we considering the split by, by, by the verticals, our survey results show that technology, IT and software, life science and financial and legal are the three most prevalent segments in terms of industry participation. And they are on the top of this ranking that you can see here. Then marketing educa and education and e-learning are fourth and fifth most common industry segments and manufacturing is in sixth place. Consumer goods and media entertainment share the seventh position. So you can see um, looking at this data, uh, it gives us a sense of where the work is. And now we can move into the key trends of, of, of our report. So for our industry analysis, as, as you all know, and if you're interested in the methodology, you can go to the report, it's, it's uh, described there. But one of the things that we do is that we held numerous briefings with players of all sizes. And considering this, plus our ranking of the top players and our watch list of significant market influencers, 
we identified a number of major trends across the industry that I want to talk to you about now. So we can go to the next slide, which is a bit spooky. Don't be scared. Uh, and the first, and the first trend that, that, that we identified this bold statement, the LSP is dead, right? But okay, what do we actually mean by that? <laughs> it's not that we are all going bankrupt or anything like that. So before I get to that, let, as I said, let me clarify a little bit that this trend is only partially true, actually. It's a reality for the biggest companies in the industry. So the ones that actually belong in our ranking or the ones that aspire to become part of our ranking. But it's not necessarily true for the smaller companies that are still the biggest part of the language service industry. As Renato mentioned before, it's almost uh, 80% according to our market sizing exercise. So what do we actually mean when we say that the traditional concept of, of LSP is dead? So we have identified this trend in the top 100 companies that of course is not, nothing new, but I think it's stronger than ever before. So the top, 10, uh, the top 100 companies, sorry, are trying to stay away from this transactional work, small uh, translation requests, and they want to focus more and more on master service agreement-based business. In that sense, uh, we believe that LSP's ability to upsell to their existing customers and to develop strong account management and customer success programs uh, play a, a key role in building and nurturing those last relationship with clients to become more like partners rather than language service providers, right? So, of course, as we all know, the needs of localization buyers have become more and more complex. And LSPs are pivoting and adapting to meet those requirements by, for example, adding additional services to their offering. The key here, and that's what we've heard from, from some of the big players, is to package the services in a way that it makes sense for your customers, right? So, for example, I, I like to, to mention the multimedia localization industry. I think it, it, it's a great example of how to identify and understand the needs of the clients and add value by offering ad adjacent services and technology such as digital packaging or cloud recording, for example. Other services that LSPs now offer as well that we, we, we've been discussing with some of the big players uh, are global content strategy, and that can include content management, content creation, even copywriting, among other services. In consequence, as we, 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 I was saying before, LSPs are becoming more like corporate service providers. It's not only language, but any service that the client needs, or even business partners that help clients expand their international business. So to know that the acronym of LSP is obsolete, we just need to have a look at the biggest players in our ranking, right? So companies such as Transperfect, Lionbridge, RWS, or Keywords are definitely not only offering language service to their clients. Um, language services is just a small part, not a small, but just a part of, of their revenues. Um, so should we therefore exclude them for, from the LSP ranking? Of course not, right? And what we need to do is to update our concept of LSP so that it reflects their complexity. And I think we need to start talking about strategic partners for business, uh, for global business, sorry, rather than just language service providers. And now we can go to the next slide because, okay, we, we, we've witnessed this shift that is stronger than ever, but how are companies in the NIMSI 100 ranking achieving this transition from LSP to a strategic partner for, for global business? Um, I think that technology is the biggest ally in the move to achieve this transformation. And 2020 made it very clear that companies with a solid technical infrastructure were able not only to survive the pandemic, but actually grow. Why? Because they were able to respond quickly to clients' challenges, such as scalability, productivity, limited budgets that came with the pandemic. The need to deliver the same services remotely, for example, in the case of interpreting or dubbing, and so on, right? Uh, a great example of companies that thrived uh, during the pandemic is language line solutions, because they had a very strong uh, uh, remote uh, interpreting infrastructure, and so they could keep delivering value to their clients, even if the circumstances were not um, the, the, the most optimal, as we know. 
So our thesis is that LSPs that only offer language services or language technology providers that only offer language technology have some limited value for more mature clients. Offering a combination of services and technology is the way forward. And in 2020, we witnessed significant mergers and acquisitions that support this thesis. For example, RWS and SDL, Straker and Lingotech, Awatera and Spikas, and Deluxe and Sandog, for example. So all these LSPs are acquiring technology companies to provide a better service to their clients. And we will probably see more of these marriages between LSPs and language tech companies or LSPs creating their own technology in, in, in the following years. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide, Nika. Following this trend of also diversification of services, implementation of technology in the, in the language um, service providers landscape, one of the most hyped services for the language services industry in the recent years has been language data for artificial intelligence, right? We, we've been hearing about that for, for a couple of years now or even more, but it's been one of the most hyped services. And actually, according to our survey this year, over one quarter of LSPs currently offer data and AI related services. That's a lot. So this was, uh, and this was also a topic that we kept uh, coming up, that kept coming up, sorry, during our interviews with, with major players. One example that illustrates the transition in this field that I like to quote is Suma Linguae Technologies. This Polish company has shifted its focus from language service provider to multilingual data provider. I think that's very interesting. And we, we're probably going to see more of these shifts in the near future. In addition, companies who have already been offering both AI services and localization report that they increasingly see a convergence of the two, to the point that sometimes it's difficult or even impossible to define whether a project is an AI or a localization project. And we can expect this field of AI localization to expand more in the coming years. And yeah, now I would like to, to pass the, the, to give the floor to Sarah again, because she's going to talk about some other trends. You're probably already bored of listening to me. <laughs> uh, never Berlin. I like listening to your voice always. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, on to the next uh, trends. Um, well, we don't need to tell you that in 2020, digital trends were booming. It's a logical consequence of the pandemic and the repeated lockdowns, um, because but even though it may feel like it at times, uh, life did not come to a halt, right? It does feel like that sometimes. But no, um, wherever possible, it just pivoted to the virtual world. And two areas that received a significant boost as a result are e-commerce and e-learning. So we're going to look at e-commerce first. In 2020, e-commerce broke all of the records and went even beyond the most ambitious of projections. Um, according to McKinsey, the U.S. e-commerce market experienced 10 years worth of growth in only three months in early 2020. And eMarketer estimates that the global e-commerce industry grew by almost a third to more than four trillion U.S. dollars in 2020. So that is quite enormous. Um, the boom in e-commerce is coming from two sides. Um, first, we, of course, have the established e-commerce platforms like Shopify that experienced a record growth in 2020. Um, the current gross merchandise volume of Shopify actually stands at $120 billion after an impressive 86% growth of GMV. And on top of that, um, then we also had um, more, the more traditional brick and mortar stores that were forced to essentially participate in the online market because of all the lockdowns. So the growth was coming from two sides in that field. Um, China is still the front runner in e-commerce and is, it is expected that in this year now, in 2021, China will become the first country in the world that will see more than half of its retail sales happening online. So also, again, a really significant um, boom there and a major shift as well in buying behavior. Um, more e-commerce, of course, means more online content, which naturally triggers down um, into localization because it creates a higher demand for localization. Um, and as our project underwear study um, has shown that looks into buying behavior, um, 
offering a product or service in a consumer's native language influences their buying decision. So if you haven't seen Project Underwear yet from us, it's a funny title, but really insightful report. You can find it on our website as well. Um, what is important to remember is that while we always talk about e-commerce as a vertical, it really is a way of selling. And in that regard, offers endless opportunities for all business segments. Now, if we look at e-learning, well, e-learning was already on the rise before the pandemic, but it has seen a notable uptick since. For the language industry, this again means more content, um, which means more opportunity for growth. And one segment to highlight within this field is the area of subtitling for corporate videos, which has seen a significant increase. The main challenges to address with e-learning localization are low budgets, scalability, and complex non-standardized workflows and content types. But what might over help overcome this challenge um, or these challenges are automatic captions, machine translation and synthetic voices, um, as well as utilizing the expertise of media service providers. Now, after the brief discussion about trends, um, let's take a look at some segments of the industry. Of course, um, the language industry has many different segments. And here we just want to highlight a few um, of the sectors that stood out in 2020 and that will be most relevant going into 2021. Starting out with my favorite, interpreting. Um, I, sorry, I, for those who don't know, I am an interpreter, so this is still where my heart is. <laughs> so the interpreting market has arguably, arguably been the sector within the industry that has been most heavily affected by the pandemic, both positively and negatively. Uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that on-site interpreting has been hit hard and has basically completely gone away or almost gone away. Um, companies whose revenues are driven by on-site interpreting reported a significant drop in business of around 70% or higher. But in turn, we're seeing an increase for remote solutions, especially remote simultaneous interpreting or RSI is in high demand right now. So much so that even companies from outside the industry are trying to cash in on this trend. Uh, Zoom, for example, has added um, interpreting as a feature. Zoom is by far the most popular video conferencing platform, probably already before the pandemic, but definitely since. And its clients tend to prefer to stick with what they know. Most remote interpreting providers can now integrate with Zoom in one form or another uh, to be able to accommodate the client's needs and also get a piece of the pie that way. Um, and this boom in RSI has also started to attract investors. RSI veteran Kudo, for example, only just secured $21 million in funding. It was just announced yesterday. Um, and this is after the company had already received $6 million in funding in July 2020. So with all of this development, RSI is really moving away from niche to becoming one of the biggest and fastest growing trends in the industry. On top of that, uh, telemedicine was another area for growth for remote interpreting providers in 2020. It's because of all the strict safety measures in the healthcare sector. Um, there was an increase in remote consultations. And of course, as people from all backgrounds need to be supported, this also meant an increase in remote interpreting. Language Line Solutions, the largest interpreting provider in the world, has long been active in the healthcare sector and increased its revenue by close to $90 million in 2020. So that's quite impressive. Um, remote interpreting in the telehealth sector was already growing before March 2020, but the pandemic accelerated this trend significantly and we can expect it to last beyond COVID-19. A note on that as well, based on our research, the future will be a mix of adaptation and coexistence, as we like to call it. <laughs> um, remote will not replace on-site interpreting, but we can expect that the current exposure to remote interpreting will have a lasting impact and expand the market. Okay, passing back to you, Belen. Thank you, Sarah. So now um, I'm going to talk about the, my favorite segment, which is media localization. Um, I will try to summarize because we're uh, running out of time and I want to give some time for questions. Uh, but yeah, 
this is the, the segment that everybody talks about, that whenever you read an industry analysis, this vertical always appears as one of the most promising and growing ones. And well, in a way it's true, but I think we need to, to take a closer look at the market to really understand what's going on. So according to our data uh, for this year, media localization companies grew by an average of around 17% in 2020 compared to 2029 even though the pandemic slowed down content production due to lockdown measures. But that's not really true in a way because uh, this growth was not organic or main, it was not mainly organic. Uh, it was mainly due to the to M&A activities, right? So uh, Renato mentioned one company before, Swiss Techs or Swiss TX, TXT. I, I call them Swiss Techs. I don't know what's the right pronunciation. Um, and they, they grew so much because they acquired this company, which doesn't even belong to the media localization industry. It's more like a tech company, right? So that's why it grew a lot, this, this company. And also because we have this, uh, this growth for this year for media localization companies, but it's not an organic growth. Uh, actually, if we remove Swix text from the ranking, the media localization companies only grew around 2% on average compared to the previous year, which is not so much, right? And even in, in 2019, the growth again was mainly due to M&A activities. In that case, it was Dubin Brothers acquiring FFS, a German dubbing company. So or, uh, organic growth was also limited in, in 2019. It was around 7% back then. In, in summary, we can say that organic growth in the media localization space is not as thriving, as thriving as it may seem uh, at the first look. Of course, in 2021, we expect this to grow. We expect this, this industry to grow organically because all the content that was not produced in 2020 due to the pandemic and lockdowns apparently will be produced this year. We'll see, fingers crossed, uh, but yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's something that we, we can be expecting this year. And also, I don't want to, to go to the next slide without talking a little bit about game localization, because that's also one of the most promising um, verticals in our industry. And of course, this, in, this is not falling behind, and it continues to grow. The segment Giant Keywords actually issued their annual report a week ago, more or less, and they reported an organic growth of, of around 12% in revenue in 2020 compared to the previous year. Even though, of course, this revenue includes much more than just language services. As we said before, DLSP is dying, right? So <laughs> keywords is one of, of, the, of those examples and they don't only provide language services. So they grew, but they grew also in, in other service lines that they are offering such as game development or functional testing, for example, more than in, in the actual localization service. Uh, also, as the gaming industry keeps growing as a whole, the type of games are also evolving, right? And games as, as services are now a big part of the industry. We have all these games that you go there and keep playing and playing and they keep adding more content. Uh, so in this area, the, the, our industry still needs to find efficient ways to manage the updates through continuous localization workflows and a centralized content management system that can also meet the, the needs of localization. Because at the moment, it's not 100% streamlined. And there are new tools trying to fill this gap, including Gridly or Localize, for example, but they still need to be adopted by the game developers plus the localization company. So we will see, it still remains to be seen whether they can meet all the requirements or not, but we're making some advances there. Um, and yeah, speaking of technology, uh, what are the trends in the language tech uh, space? We can go to the next slide because technology is all over our industry and it's of course important. So I want to share with you some insights that we learned from our NIMSI technology expert, Julia Kulkova. Um, the first thing is data, right? Data, again, we, we talked about data before, but this is super important in, in, in this section as well, because the field for natural language processing and language data is getting bigger and bigger are even more hungry for quality data. We don't only need data, but quality data, right? 
So to prepare data, create empty training, evaluate empty engines and fine tune the, the empty processes, we still human specialists for, for that. And for them, this works on empty customization may now be quicker thanks to products such as Spot Spotlight by Intento. One of the tools uh, from Intento's Empty Studio, the toolkit uh, for complex empty curation. So we are starting to see technology in this space to facilitate the creation of quality data, and that's important. And also following the language data trends, uh, Systran announced their Systran, their Systran data and multilingual catalog of industry-specific translation models. These models are designed by a community of experts called trainers, and are offered in self-service to professional users. So for example, in the event that a contributor like an LSP already has language data collected over time, they can now uh, make that available and monetize it to this type of data marketplaces. The same with Tau Data Marketplace, which was released in November 2020. And it's a platform for both data sellers, so translators, data producers, LSPs, and data buyers, empty providers, enterprises, and so on. So we, we're seeing a, a lot going on here and the focus on these future marketplaces projects that may come up uh, in the following years needs to be, they need to pay close attention, as we said, to the quality of the language data being exchanged and also the validation of the ownership. So that's uh, about data. And when it comes to TMS, uh, the TMS arena, we can say that it has been bombarded with investments and M&A deals uh, as the industry in general. So the language technologies are not an exception here. In January 21 alone, we saw that Across was acquired by Volaris, Memsource acquired Praise, and Ningotech was acquired by Straker Group. So a lot going on here in terms of, of um, also mergers and consolidation of, of technology in, in our industry. However, uh, if you have a, a look at our NIMSI language technology atlas, you can still see that we feature more than 140 TMS solutions. So there's some slight consolidation, but we're still getting there. And finally, uh, before I hand over the word to, to Sarah again, I just want to briefly talk about Rucha, oh, sorry, about India, and what I learned from my colleague and expert on India, Rucha said. Thank you, Rucha, for sharing your expertise. I think this is a fascinating topic and a fascinating country for us to look at. Uh, so as we all know, India's digital economy is booming, and especially in 2020. Areas such as OTT services and digital multimedia content production and consumption, video games, social media, e-learning platforms, e-commerce, everything grew a lot in 2020 in India. And the potential, of course, for language services is far from saturated, as the figures on the slide illustrate. You can see how many millions of, of people in India, how many languages they speak, and how many of them are accessing all these digital services. In addition, and I think this is very interesting, the country's, the India's union budget for 2021 announced the launch of the National Language Translation Mission. So according to this initiative, the entire governance and policy related knowledge on the internet now has to be uh, made available in major Indian languages. So this is very new in India and, and also very exciting for the localization industry. Missions like this one will provide a big boost to regional language initiatives. It will also encourage agencies to translate scientific and technology content into Indian languages, which until now it's basically available in English only. And this initiative will, of course, have a positive effect on the Indian language and the language technology ecosystem especially for the language technology companies who build capabilities in Indian writing systems and digitize the fonts. So, so many things to do here. And actually, this, this wasn't a surprise for most uh, big companies in the world, such as Microsoft, Facebook, YouTube, Netflix, Prime Video, Flipkart, or Amazon, that have already localized their sites and their content into various Indian languages. This is very interesting and there are lots of opportunities here for for the localization industry however 
the main challenge that LSPs may face in this in going into into localization in India is talent acquisition and low prices. As LSPs flock towards India, we expect a battle for the best talent in the local market. And now I will give the floor to Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Vilen. Yeah, I know uh, we're already a little bit tight for time, so I'm going to try to make this brief. Uh, we have a special section um, about the effect of COVID-19 on the industry in the last year. Of course, as you've already noticed, we've been bringing up the pandemic throughout the webinar already because it has just touched upon pretty much everything in the last year. But there are just a few um, high-level takeaways or some takeaways that apply to the overall industry that I want to walk you through. So uh, let's first look at this uh, graph here um, because it has a few interesting stats. Um, in our survey, close to 75% of respondents reported that the pandemic has had an impact on their business. Not surprisingly, because again, everyone was impacted in one way or another. Um, as to specify, our data show that a shift to remote work was the most common effect, followed by a decrease or loss of existing business and a suspension or termination of work from clients. But on a more positive note, um, a bunch of respondents also saw an increase of existing business and a decrease in expenses. And when it comes to um, layoffs because of reduced volumes versus onboarding of new staff due to increased volumes, the figures are very similar. Now let's look at the impact. Um, we already said the pandemic is affecting segments of the industry in different ways. For example, in the healthcare and the life sciences sector, we saw a huge increase for anything related to COVID-19, but a significant decrease for anything non-essential like elective surgeries, physical therapy, and routine consultations. In the legal sector then, it was mostly business as usual, but sub-segments were affected in different ways. So for example, courts were closed and law firms were switching to video remote interpreting. Immigration has effectively come to a halt because of the imposed travel bans. And in the government sector, demand is down by about 50% because governments are only focusing on essential services and COVID-19 related communication. Um, we already talked about on-site interpreting and that it has been hit hard, but um, that um, remote solutions are trending right now. Then no surprise, uh, work from home. Um, we expect that work from home is here to stay. Um, the language industry was already very remote friendly before March, 2020, but the pandemic took it to a new level. Basically overnight uh, players of all sizes had to move their entire staff um, to the virtual world. And most of them pulled it off without major difficulties, which is also quite impressive. Um, the new work from home situation changed the way we work um, and we can expect it to have a lasting impact on the industry. That being said, most companies will also go back to their offices after the pandemic or consider offering a hybrid model to their staff. Then um, what we've seen is that in many ways, the COVID-19 pandemic has acted as an accelerator. It has intensified trends and widened the gap between those who already had remote solutions and digital offerings in place and those who did not. So companies who were prepared, well, they thrived, uh, whereas those who ran entirely on-site focused operations saw an accelerated downturn. So acceleration in either direction. And in addition, or in the same vein, the pandemic also became a catalyst for internal projects. So many may have thought for, for years that yes, offering remote solutions or having a better digital presen um, presence is like nice to have, but suddenly almost overnight, it became a must have to keep businesses afloat. And in a related trend, we saw that those who had the right technology in place well, they basically won the race. They shot ahead of everyone else and increased their growth by being able to cash in on those remote trends like remote interpreting in the telehealth field or remote dubbing in media localization. And those who weren't set up properly, well, they were hastily trying to catch up by basically launching maybe new RSI platforms now or finally working on their digital presence and on automation. Um, well, as I say, revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. Um, 
And while growth might have slowed down across the industry, as Renato told us earlier, and for some LSPs, um, revenues also have decreased, profitability actually went up. In our survey, almost half of the respondents stated that their profitability increased in 2020. And in the majority of cases, this is a side effect of the lockdowns because there was no or very little travel, uh, reduced need for office space, and basically no in-person events. So these byproducts of the pandemic translated into a decrease in expenses, which in turn then increased profitability. So now that we know the impact, let's just briefly go over the strategies that some LSPs employed to handle the new challenge. Especially in the early stages of the pandemic, helping customers move their business online became the number one task for companies of all sizes. Because any client that didn't already have a digital presence needed one now and fast. So on the translation side of the industry, this led to an increasing demand for website localization. And on the interpreting side, uh, corporate businesses and government entities alike were reaching out looking for remote interpreting solutions. And of course, customer service is always important in a service industry, but this really was also an opportunity for LSPs to shine and really support their clients by offering faster turnaround, 24-7 availability, and just going that extra mile. And then more than ever, LSPs also ramped up their sales and even more so their marketing efforts. Um, because of the lockdowns, again, um, and all the restrictions, the traditional sales channels like conferences and face-to-face -face meetings, they were not available anymore. So LSPs had to come up with new ideas and many ran ads or campaigns and reach out initiatives. Um, and a bunch of companies we talked to, they also said that they expanded their sales team as part of their strategy to avoid losses during this time. And in the same vein, marketing and especially digital marketing became crucial so many companies expanded their marketing, marketing teams significantly after March 2020. Last but not least, um, the pandemic forced many to take a closer look at their internal structures. So for some, it became all about managing cash flow and others invested heavily into technology and increasing their digital presence. Um, and because the pandemic affected different segments of the market in different ways, many LSPs reacted by reshuffling the internal resources. So taking people from the travel and hospitality division that was down and moved them to the life sciences division that was booming. And in addition, um, companies were also looking at their client portfolios because once the pandemic hit, it became very apparent that LSPs with a diverse client base performed much better than those who derive most of their revenue from one or two large clients in a certain vertical. So we made it, where do we go from here? As it stands in March 21, we're still in a worldwide pandemic and lockdown measures continue. Nobody can know how long this is going to last, but what we do know is that once the restrictions are lifted, we can expect an explosion of content. For example, uh, once production can resume in the media space, the market will be flooded with new movies and TV shows. I personally can't wait, um, which will also translate uh, into a massive spike for media localization down the line. And then the travel and hospitality business um, plummeted during the pandemic, but it's reasonable to assume that once people are allowed to travel again, uh, this segment of the industry will experience a huge boost. And while not all trends and workarounds from the pandemic will remain in place, we can expect some trends and innovations to have a lasting impact on the industry. Like again, remote dubbing and remote interpreting, they experienced such a big boost uh, in the last year because they came to the rescue of two otherwise heavily impacted segments of the market. They say never to waste a good crisis and we can confidently say that the language industry certainly did no such thing. And this is also why we put our growth estimate back on track and predict that the industry will reach around $74 billion by 2025. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Sarah, Belen, Renato. That was a lot of information <laughs> packed into a, into a tight hour. So uh, we do have some time for questions. We got a couple of questions here. Um, here's one from Oscar. How do you classify companies like Kudo? It defines itself as a non-LSP. 
Yeah, that is actually a very good question and something we have also talked about before. Um, companies like Kudo or also even more so companies like Wordly. Um, I mean, um, yeah, let's back up a bit. Actually, Kudo, they've recently started to refer to themselves as a language as a service company, which I think is a really nice term um, and maybe one that we can start using in the industry as well. Um, Kudo, for example, they still, you know, their focus is they provide the technology and then they still have the, the human interpreters. So that's one type of company there. Um, but then if you even look at companies like uh, Wordly, they do machine interpreting. So they're, they're basically replacing the human interpreter and they're offering this as, um, as a service. It's like a service and a technology offering together. So I guess we have to come up with uh, maybe a new term for this type of company now as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. We have another question here from Winnie. Hey, hi, Winnie. You mentioned human specialists needed when you talked about all about that data. Could you please give us some examples? How do you recommend current practitioners in the market translators pivot to the new roles? Belen, I think this was a question during, um, during one of your slides. Yes, that was one of the questions I was fearing I, I would get because <laughs> the expert on technology is Julia, as I pointed out, but very good question, uh, Winnie. Uh, I don't have a very long answer to this, but I, I've seen more and more colleagues that come from translation background going into uh, annotation analyst roles in companies such as Apple or, you know, big companies where they want to to classify, for example, the, the customer um, replies that they get, if they are positive, negative, and things like that. So data analyst is, is one, or data annotation is one of the of the trends that I'm seeing in these. And yeah, Helen, Renato. Let, let me jump in here. Of course. I think that this is a, a, a very pertinent question in the sense that uh, there is a lot of uncertainty and fear. But this is the nature of the translation industry. I remember when computers came into the industry, I'm that old, and people were saying, oh my God, it's the end of the translators, uh, computers are going to take over. I remember when translation memory came into the industry, oh my God, our prices are going to plummet and this industry is going to finish. I remember when machine translation came into the industry. So every movement that we have that advances the technology uh, represents a challenge. And this is natural, it's change, it's natural. The challenge that we have in, the, in our space is that change is, have, is, is happening very fast. And uh, the new generations are not coming up as fast as needed. So my answer to the question is essentially the, the, the way that uh, current practitioners uh, in the market pivot to the new roles is by saying yes. Instead of fighting the the... The, the, the new realities, instead of saying, oh, I'm not going to do this kind of work, uh, say yes. And, and be prepared, be open to changing ways of working. I, I can't believe that there is anybody today that uh, doesn't use a web browser to do research and still looking at paper dictionaries when they're doing their job the way I used to. I quit smoking because dictionaries disappeared, because I needed to look up every time i looked up a word in the dictionary i needed to light a cigarette and uh when the internet came i i didn't need to smoke anymore so the the answer would be uh be open be open to change a lot is going to change but uh don't conflate the the conversation about new ways of working with pricing. That's a very separate conversation. And we as translators very frequently uh, try to mix the two conversations that have nothing to do one with the other. Focus on the productivity number. And also uh, a little thing, uh, if you want to pivot, pivot also to other activities in the industry like project management, like vendor management and, and things like that. And I think we're at the top of the we're hour. Of, yes, we're, we are basically out of time. So thank you to everyone who has joined. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to the speakers, Belen, Sarah, Renato. Uh, this recording will be available on NIMSI's YouTube channel and you will be getting an email from Zoom with information about that. 
And of course, check out the NIMSY 100 if you haven't, uh, it's on our website. So thank you once again to everybody who joined. If you have questions, you can always uh, email us as well and do check out the report. So with that. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We're gonna thank wave goodbye. Bye. Bye everybody.